with Valentino giving me soups. Pac had that attitude and that air, but when he sat, came in my office, he was just being a nice young man, respectful. And I thought that Tupac was genius, but I also thought that Tupac was buck wild. And I thought Tupac felt he had something he needed to prove. He got the tattoo Thug Life on him, and he called me, and uh, he was very excited about it. He said, I, I want you to see this tattoo. So I saw the tattoo, and I said, what have you done? To my brother, stay strong, keep your heads up. He was now Tupac the Outlaw, but songs like the inflammatory I Don't Give a Fuck, Tupac's rage would prove contagious. When a Texas teenager shot a policeman, his lawyer blamed Tupac's music. When I heard about what he thought had happened and who he blamed, uh, and he mentioned a couple of names, Puffy and Biggie and my name, and a Vibe interview, uh, I thought to myself, I know he didn't think I did that. And, I, and then I thought, I know Pop didn't do that. And I thought to myself, not knowing Biggie the way I know Pop, I didn't think that either. I look guilty. In a very short period of time, Death Row Records had become one of the major success stories of contemporary American music. Death Row's success was based on gangster rap. Talking about selling drugs, talking about murdering, talking about womanizing, and talking about partying. Death Row had a message that talked to Generation X, a generation who suffered uh, all the symptoms that Reaganomics brought about. Crack, loss of social programs after school, summer jobs, loss of funding for inner city kids to go to college, and basically loss of hope. Death Row was really about bringing some real violence to the table. They talked tough, they was going to be tough. It wasn't uh, about creating like uh, a piece of art and a piece of fantasy. It was really about reflecting a lifestyle they were leading on records. And they were prepared to bring it to the forefront at any moment. Suge Knight formed Death Row with gangster rap producer Dr. Dre. And with an alleged loan from jail drug dealer Michael Harris, Suge made gangster rap a multi-million dollar business. And I had been hanging out with Tupac that week because I wanted Tupac to do an episode of a television show called New York Undercover here. So uh, they called me and they said that Tupac is coming down and uh, we want you to come down, Andre. So I said, all right. So I got there. We're on one floor, a little short, and Biggie Smalls on another floor. When Tupac arrived at the studio, a gang of armed assailants approached and shot him five times. Tupac comes off the elevator and he's upset. And I'm looking at him like, trying to figure out what's the matter. And he said, then I look at his head and he's bleeding. And then he said, he just got shot. So he's taking off his coat and he's looking around like, who did this? And I'm like, I'm standing in the front, almost like, when he gets up, I'm like right there, and I'm trying to, you know, calm him down. And then I realized, oh, my man is in shock right now. He just got shot. Tupac was rushed to hospital, but the following morning he appeared in court to face his rape charges. I said, Tupac, get up, get out of that bed, get up to that courtroom. So if that jury come out, you want the jury to see that you don't disrespect them because the main reason they shot you or whatever was to keep you from showing up. He knew who was there at the hotel scene where the raping took place. And there were some people who were part of that situation who were like really known in the streets as really being notorious bad guys. So I thought that maybe the incident might have had something to do with what Tupac potentially could say to defend himself to say that he didn't do it and maybe somebody else did the raping. And I thought that was like a message to say, before you think about doing that, you better do this. And I think he knew that, but I don't think at that point he was prepared to address that beef with that particular group of folks, because that particular group of folks, they weren't about records, they were about beefs. Tupac's career
Kaur was convicted of a third degree felony, which in, in many respects is a very minor crime uh, in New York. He was not convicted of rape, as some people say. He was not even convicted of any kind of sexual assault. It was a third degree uh, offense. And the judge gave him what I thought was an outrageous uh, sentence for that. Uh, he was uh, uh, scheduled to spend from a year and a half to four and a half years in prison. The court ruled that Tupac had played at least a minor role in the rape of Ayanna Jackson. He had forcibly touched her buttocks. Tupac was sent to a maximum security prison, and when the charges against his gangster friends were dismissed, the press wondered whether Tupac had been set up for having shot two policemen in Atlanta. I look guilty. Tupac, are you guilty? Hell no. I look guilty to you. You said you're not guilty, Tupac. It's difficult to answer why Tupac was signed to death row, because we disagree. He, uh, he leaned over and he said, you know, I know I'm young and I'm impressionable. That's what you think. I know I'm selling my soul to the devil. I see this as a temporary move. I believe I can, I can survive this. In exchange for his freedom, Tupac would join death row's roster of gangster rappers. Tupac promised Shoke he would become the label's biggest, most important artist. Shoke bailed Tupac out, and after 11 months in jail, Tupac was on his way to a new life with the man in the red suit. When Vice President Dan Quayle announced that Tupacalypse Now had no place in American society, Tupac's outlaw credentials were sealed. They had consensual sex. She actually, he left a room and went to sleep in another room, and he left her with guys that she actually came with and didn't knew. Tupac took me by the hand and led me to the bedroom. Just as we began kissing, the door opened and I heard people entering. As I started to turn to see who it was, Tupac grabbed my arm and said, Don't worry, baby. These are my brothers and they aren't going to hurt you. We do everything together. This unsigned account was sent to Vibe magazine, accusing Tupac of having instigated the rape. Tupac protested his innocence, claiming he was too afraid of his gangster friends to stop them. He was charged with rape and sexual assault. Exactly what happened that night would become the subject of conjecture. On the night before Tupac was to appear in court, someone would try to kill him. Tupac's first album for Death Row, All Eyes on Me, would become one of the biggest selling rap albums of all time. California Love would become one of Tupac's biggest singles. It would also mark his decline as a political artist. He would start meeting real gangsters. A fortnight after the Atlanta shootout, two men would take Tupac to a New York nightclub where he would become involved in an incident that would increase his notoriety. The incident began with a woman named Ayanna Jackson. It's not about East or West. It's about niggas and bitches, power and money, riders and punks. Which side are you on? With the song Bomb First, Tupac would use his music to escalate Shug's war with Puffy Combs' New York-based Bad Boy Records. Shug had declared war on Puffy at an awards ceremony for rap journal The Source. I think he wanted to be a gangster. He wanted to prove to the gangsters he, was, he could do it. He was a gangster. He was black-hearted, or could do whatever had to be done. That's why I fucked your bitch, you fat motherfucker. West side, bad boy killer. Once he had been willing to do anything to defend black people's freedom, but with Hit'em Up, Tupac would use his music to attack his friends. He would brag about sleeping with Biggie Small's wife. It seemed to me that it was just personal envy and, and, and jealousy that, that snowballed into what became this East, this Death Row versus Bad Boy, this Tupac versus Biggie, this Suge versus Puff thing. Personally, I think Tupac had a death wish. We're gonna kill all you motherfuckers. Now, when I came out, I told you it was just about Biggie. He would threaten to kill Biggie Smalls and Puffy Combs. Fuck Biggie. Fuck Bad Boy as a staff, record label, and as a motherfucking crew. You he would also threaten to kill anyone associated with Bad Boy Records. I cannot tell you why Tupac had a death wish. But I knew one thing. The way he was talking on records, the way he was living, the way he was thinking, just listening to it what he was saying on records, how he was rolling, who he's rolling with. I said, my man is heading for a crash. You can't roll with that much drama and not have some real drama come at you. Tupac had lost everything he'd gained from his association with Suge Knight and Death Row. But Tupac's murder also signaled the decline of Death Row.
For his part in the brawl that night in Vegas, the court sentence showed to nine years in prison. A week after Shug was jailed, Biggie Smalls was murdered in L.A. I think Tupac and Biggie destroyed Gangster Rap because you lost two of the biggest, brightest rap stars we had ever seen, all in a swoop of madness in a short period of time, just as they were really starting to evolve as personalities and really penetrate mainstream America. We're almost there. We're almost there. With I Ain't Mad At You, Tupac made public his obsession with facing a violent death at an early age. Come on. Call him and tell him that the patient's DOA. He's gone. Man, I've been struggling trying to get in here a long time. You're going to have to earn your way. She hope you can make it. I'm going to try. Thanks for lying. When the Panthers' attempted revolution was destroyed by the American government, the Panthers' children were left to fend for themselves. As long as when you change, you change for the better. Really they grew up and became the hip-hop nation, and Tupac became their symbol. Uh, Valentino giving me soup.